Hello. Okay, I'm going to wait until more folks are in the room and then I will <clears throat> get to some like housekeeping items. Uh, okay, boy. So, <clears throat> um, hello. Uh, a few things. I feel like there's enough people that I can do housekeeping y things. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the work of everybody who did. Oh, hi, Undertale Music. Um, who did Global Game Jam over the weekend. And do, 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 here we go. Um, so we had 34 jammers and we had 13 games come out of the site, which is excellent. So I wanted to share boop, the games. Um, and we had a lot, of, we had like a really great diversity of games. There were, there was everything from like there's an augmented re or uh, alternate reality game. There are game maker games. There's a Pico 8 game. There's Unity, Unreal, all kinds of stuff. So um, if you went and you did it, pat yourself on the back. Um, if you didn't go, uh, go check out the games and you know give a little round of applause to the people who did Global Game Jam. Um, you know, and if you didn't do it, that's cool. Like you know. Uh, highly encourage you do it maybe next year or something, but um, you know it's just a great event. So I'm always super happy when people uh, take advantage of it uh, and you know like this important industry thing and you know launch some games, get some game fodder for their portfolios. So good job. Um, today, what do we have? 12 people, 12, 13 people. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to get started. So today what we are talking about is elements of games. Now, what do I mean by that? So last week we talked about um, games, like the, the, you know, where game ideas can come from and really like the core elements of games, focusing mostly on mechanics. And we're still going to be focused mostly on like the mechanic part of games. Um, but, you know, it's much more than big game mechanics. You know, uh, we talked about, you know, the core mechanics of, say, like Mario last week. And when you play a game like Mario, you have this like singular core of something like... Um, you know, you have a singular core of like core mechanic, but you know, all of your design decisions kind of like waterfall off of or snowball off of that core mechanic. So it's like Mario, it's about jumping. So your level design emphasizes the jumping. The sound implementation emphasizes the jumping by having like a satisfying boing when Mario jumps and you know, a lot of the enemies are defeated by jumping. Or enemies become dangerous when you can't jump on them, like spinies. Um, so there's there's lots of things in the games that um, in the game like that that goes around jumping. But that's beyond just the core mechanic. Um, so you know what are these other things that we control and manipulate as game designers, and then how do they? create game experience. And that's what we want to look at today uh, when we talk about the elements of games. But first, I want to do, uh, I want to um, start with something kind of weird. What is a game? And for this, I want you to actually put into the chat what, like, a definition of what you think a game is. And, you know, we can talk about it. I'm going to take a swig of water. I'm also going to put my phone on Do Not Disturb.
Okay, so somebody says, something you play. So that's kind of a neat, uh, I'm, keep them coming. I'm gonna wait for at least two, but I'd like to see like as many people as possible throw ideas out there. Uh, something that you play, like that's kind of neat because there's play involved in the definition and experience that a player can play through or interact within. Aha, uh -huh, okay, um, that's kind of neat. Uh, I'm actually really interested in that one and I'm gonna point out why, because it lacks something. And that's not a bad thing. I don't mean that in a bad way. Something you play for either entertainment or competition. That's interesting. Uh, entertainment with a set of challenges. Okay. Got that E word again. Um, an intractable environment. Ooh. Ooh, that's an interesting one. I like that one. Intractable implies like, again, challenge, competition, things like that. So um, yeah, let's go <clears throat> with that. Keep them coming if you've still got ones. Um, you know, I, I welcome all uh, suggestions. But let's, let's look at, you know, some takes on this idea because like, you know, one of the weird things about teaching this and both this and animation, you know, like when I, like I went to design school and I went to, you know, architecture school and I know and have taught courses in like graphic design school as well. Um, like I, I've, you know, either been like adjacent to a graphic design program uh, at like an art school where there happened to be game design, or I've even taught like graphic design classes, um, you know, related to my teaching position. And what's interesting about those fields is that like, you know, as it, when you're a kid, you might be in buildings and look at graphic design because you're like physically occupying buildings, but also you are like, looking at media, but you don't really have the same relationship of like observation and interaction that you do with games and animation. You know, the, we are in weird, we're in a weird media type, and I'm going to stick to games because this is a game class. <clears throat> we're in a weird media type with games where students come into it with a lot of history of deeply engaging with the medium. And um, you know, also like a lot of history engaging with the community of that medium. Um, you know, again, to use architecture as an example, you might occupy buildings, but you don't read architecture books, uh, before you go to like architecture school. Some people do, but you know, it's not quite the same thing. You don't go to AIA meetings, um, as, as a, as a teenager, again, unless you somehow do, um, Whereas like, as a person who plays video games, you might read IGN, you might go on a forum, you might be on a few games discords, you might, uh, you know, go like participate, you might go to gaming conventions, you might cosplay, you might do all these things that are deeply embedded. So taking a step back and being like, what is a game? People are, you know, it's kind of weird because you're kind of like, Oops. Oh no. Another. I really hope somebody's keeping score of this in this class. Um, you know, because you could very easily be like, um, you know, or Matt, like pretend I had my board game or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, like, let me check what my okay cool cinematography um so you know like it is kind of I, I acknowledge the weirdness of asking like what is a game so um but why this is useful is that we can really like start to pick games apart and this is what we should be doing like this is um 
this is a thing that I think, like, when you get into this, when you get into making these things, you cease to be a, just a consumer. Like, you've seen The Matrix and you cannot go back, basically. And what's important about that is that you... It's, it's kind of like your job now to professionally really deconstruct and break these things apart and deeply understand that. Um, so many of the assumptions that you might have had as a fan are kind of, you have to like throw them out the window. Um, because if you can do that, if you can develop this ability to kind of like see the little moving parts and all the gears that go on it behind the, the curtain of the thing, then suddenly you will be able to you know, fine tune it and tweak it and and get it so that it creates, you know, the the experiences that we have with games that got us all here in the first place that we love so much. So um, let's go look at, here's a famous game designer, Ralph Coster, or Ralph Coster, uh, um, author of the book, A Theory of Fun for Game Design, worked at, I believe it was EA for a number of years, has just like been a, a mainstay of the industry. Um, so here's an interesting take. So he has a, an article that's like, here are 2,600 words in which I dismantle the term game, um, enjoy if such is possible. But um, he also points out, you know, anything can be a game. And why that's interesting is because you can like break apart this idea of, you know, a few things. One, <clears throat> well, I'm going to hold that one back for a second. Um, I guess the big thing is like, if we think about activities, um, being, um, there's like some playful element to everything or some competitive element or, you know, some scoring element or something to things in life, right? Um, you know, we talked last week about the core of some games and my friend's game, Prom Week, who like that was about the week before prom. You played it as a game. Well, when you're a teenager, the week before prom is like the most serious thing. But it's also a really funny premise for a video game. Um, because, you know, there's like a lot of inherent social silliness that happens that, again, you're super serial about. But you're also like, and yes, I made a, if anybody recognized the South Park reference there. Um, but the, uh, you know, you can make, I don't want to say gamify, that's a gross word. Um, you know, you can make a game about that and, and the social play of that experience, that social experience becomes, you know, uh, stuff for a game or again, uh, friends of mine in architecture school who actually, you know, went on to become architects, you have to do years of apprenticeship and the apprenticeship is tracked via a point system where you get enough experience that, you eventually like get to say, okay, I'm, I have got enough points and experience to reach this point where I am highly ranked enough to like take this exam. And I've needled friends of mine being like, that's a role playing game. They're like, no, it's not. It's like, that's, that's a role playing game. You're leveling up and getting experience points so that you can fight the final boss, um, which is the the licensing exam. And they're like, no, stop it. Um, so, yeah, there's like a lot. But think about all the games like, you know, Cooking Mama or, um, you know, uh, uh, Shenmue. That's like the life of a salary man, but also a game. Um, you know, these are games. And you can really, like, why is that important? Because, again, if you can see that and you can start to analyze the way games work and the way games work as systems and then maybe the way that other things are systems. Um, I mean, the bane of every professor, frankly, is, like, that students are so good at 
playing college like a game and min maxing it like how can i get the most grade how can i max my grade doing the min amount of the readings you know like don't one we see it because <laughs> and some of us did it so you know um one know that but two like you know you're you're gaming you're gaming it um and and because you understand this deeply as as a game player so um and i'm not like saying shame on you i'm saying like think about that aspect of being in school and you know apply that kind of mindset not trying to min max your way through life or something but yeah but um you know understanding that like you can see it as a system and why is that important because really what that comes down to is eventually um you'll be able to one, see your games as systems and learn how to tweak them to get the effect that you want. But also, you know, you could potentially also see other subject matter for your games than sci-fi, fantasy, modern combat. You know, all the same old crap. Um, you know, you can come up with like new ideas for games because you can see the gamefulness in, in things like that. Um, so... Yeah, life is just a roguelike. Life's like a roguelike game. Um, so let's look at a definition of game, like a textbook definition of games. Uh, a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict. Some of you talked about competition. Defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. Does anybody notice anything missing? And I don't mean that in like a, uh, this is an, in a, in, an inadequate definition. I mean like what is, I actually think this is a very good definition, which is why I put it in a fancy seeming font and really big on a slide. Um, so play is, it's not in there. It's also kind of in there because the, it calls them players. Um... I can tell you that, that Salem and Zimmerman, well, you've taken games for education, person who said play. Um, there's actually like quite a bit of discussion of play. I can see why though. This, I will say this definition is a bit clinical because it is like system, artificial conflict, def defined, quantifiable. You know, it's a little clinical. Um, so play isn't immediately apparent but it seems to kind of describe play okay here we go entertainment or for fun are all games fun and i don't mean like you know, i don't want you to be like oh yeah there are games that are not fun because they suck that's not what i'm asking L let me rephrase this are all movies for entertainment are all movies for entertainment. Think about that. <clears throat> Some are made to inform, yes. Some are made to like be gut-wrenching and shocking and, you know, uh, maybe through that like negative emotion confront you with like a dark chapter of human history you know nobody like gets cozy under a blanket and get some hot chocolate going and just wants to take a nice relaxing saturday to watch the passion of the christ you know um that's just, it's not an that's not like a movie that you curl up under a blanket for <laughs> um uh, that's not me saying like it is of poor quality or anything about like, you know, Christianity and stuff like that. That's not where I'm aiming that statement uh, in case anybody is worried about that. Um, what I'm aiming it at is like it's a movie meant to illustrate the passion and death of Christ to kind of like 
you know, elicit the horror of that experience, um, you know, for, and, you know, it's Mel Gibson for religious reasons and things like that. Um, but, you know, that is the purpose of the movie. It's not, like, it's not made for the same reason that, like, Avengers Endgame is. Um, well, so, again, I'm staying away from boring... Oh, wait, let me see. There's no sense of entertainment or worthwhile experience. It would be a pleasant experience, but at least you can remember something from it. Okay. Um, so, and I'm not even getting into, like, you know, the kind of good fun, like, like Mystery Science Theater 3000. I'm literally meaning, like, is it the job of all games to be fun? Because, you know, for example, one that we talked about in the Games for Education class is the game Train, where you, um, it's a resource management game where you try to get as many little yellow tokens into a train as you can before the train reaches its destination along the track. Um, and then there's these like little subtle things in the cards, in the, the surface that you play it on, things like that. I should mention this is like an art game um, created by Brenda Romero. But the twist of the game is that at some point through engaging with the system but then also through hints in the materials you realize that the role you are taking on in the game is of a nazi officer loading uh jewish people onto a train on their way to a concentration camp and you know people have like played this and broken down and cried it's a meaningful experience so some of you have been using the word experience that's a great word it's a meaningful experience. You don't sit and it's like, oh man, I got this game for game night. You know, you don't say that with that game. You can't actually. There's like really only one of them. Because um, again, it's an art piece. But the point is, is to confront you with these unpleasant things in human history and then start a conversation about that. Um, so, you know, that's the thing about fun isn't assumed in games and again that can mean that your game can be interesting in that way and novel in that way you know, like you can do more with games than just make like oh man a cool game i just want to make the games that i love to play everybody says that and it's crap <laughs> you know whenever somebody tells you like you know when you come up with a game studio name for yourself someday, you know, when you're like a professional developer, if that's your reason to be, you're not going to go very far because everybody to some extent has that and it's not unique. Um, you know, this is where you want to like really find something that makes you unique. Um, and so again, that's why like we learn to break these things down. We learn to see what is and is not an inherent part of games. Fun is not an inherent part of games. That being said, you know, there are instances where something that hooks you in and keeps you engaged, you know, and maybe it's that it's fun, maybe it's that it's interesting, maybe that it's meaningful, but it doesn't always have to be a positive emotion. It can be a negative emotion, but delivered in a meaningful way. Again, like a train or like watching, you know, Schindler's List or something like that. Um, watching, you know, like the, the, you know, recent environmental, like, you know, uh, global warming version of like planet Earth, right? You know, everybody always shares the clip of, of the sea lions uh, or was it walruses? They, you know, they, they were trying to get up a cliff, but because of global warming, the cliff would crumble under them and, you know, they would fall. Um, and that's not fun to watch, um, but it's, like, important to watch kind of things. Um, but it is, like, well-crafted. Like, it is a competent film. Um, so the meaning comes through. So... You know, design, so we've talked about games. Now, what about design? Uh, well, design is the process by which a designer, us, uh, creates a context, context, here's our context that we make, video game, uh, or game, or board game, um, or 
you know, board game. Um, to be encountered by a participant. My son's not here, he's napping, but otherwise I like hold up a baby because uh, he plays games with me sometimes. Um, from which meaning emerges. So again, that emotional part. Um, so, okay, here's a question for everybody. And this is where, this will be one of the rare instances that I do want you to go full consumer. I do want you to go full fan. In the chat, whatever you feel like sharing, tell me like a good, a good game playing memory, like a meaningful, good, like gameplay memory that occupies your brain rent free. Like, you know, people ask, uh, I'll talk about one of mine while you, you know, the video catches up and you write yours. Um, so people ask me like what my favorite video game is a lot, like a lot, a lot. And, um, I used to actually hate this question, but I actually appreciate it now because I, I've come to learn that you can really tell a lot about a person by what they say. Um, not so much by the game that they choose, but more so by like how they quant how they explain their answer. So um, I will always go like right to like Super Mario Brothers three. See, it's it's behind my shoulder even, um, and I've actually gotten yelled at for this answer. And the reason being that like, but you're like ignoring. Uh, decades of games after Super Mario Brothers 3. Are you really saying that's the, like, best game of the entire form? And it's like, no, obviously not. And there are better games since, and there were probably better games before, or more historically impactful games before. You know, the original Super Mario Brothers being one of them in terms of historic impact. But it's like, you know... That none of the, Metal Gear Solid or Half Life was not the game that my friend was playing when I was over his house when I was four. And it like struck me that this was a moving cartoon that could like be this like expansive world that I wanted to be in, right? Like that, that, that game hit me like a truck. Um, in terms of being like, wow, you know, I really learned what a game could be through seeing that game at that very particular moment and age, right? And so, like, you know, no game can ever rep replicate that um, for me personally. So there's a lot of personal experience in there. Um, and, and again, it's associated with, like, you know, hanging out with your friends when you're very young, uh, being a little kid, uh, the first time, you know, anybody had ever, like, seen in my neighborhood somebody beat the game was when my friend Mike beat Mario 3. He, like, called his mom. Um, you know, he was over at my house. Like, we were jumping up and down. Even my mom was excited. Um, you know, like, there's no, uh, that's, that's the meaning. So, okay, uh, burr, 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 burr. my sisters and I would play Harvest Moon on the GameCube early in the morning. Um, so like, you know, yeah, you're kind of working together and, and you have that sort of like, that was your time, right? Like you'd get up and then you'd like you'd play Harvest Moon. Um, final level of Halo 3 in an Xbox party with two of my friends online at like two in the morning, nothing but screaming and laughing the whole time. Yeah, like... Playing games together, um, you know, Towerfall or Super Smash Brothers with my friends. Like, it really was like my Smash Brothers friends, and then we got together and eventually, you know, did Towerfall and other board games together. Um, Majora's Mask, first ever N64 beat as a kid. Uh, all the dynamics made me want to keep exploring, uh, you know, explore the mask, things like that. First time playing Portal 2 all the way through, ending was satisfying, emotional. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Lifelong friends playing Melee in the first grade. See, so like you, and a lot of these are like communal gaming experiences. Um, okay. In my mind, due to added difficulty for attacking and casting. Cool. So like, 
you know, but a lot of these are communal. A lot of these are like, wow, this is a really game. That's a game that like really showed me like was really cool. Um, you know, but there's a lot of these like emotional ties that you get GTA three with a friend. Uh, well, actually, we'll talk about that in a second because there is like an element of games that, um, you know, like sometimes in some games you get to do stuff that are not what you get to do in real life. And that's a cool experience. Um, you know, some of that is like I get to be a super soldier and playing Halo and some of it's like, ooh, I get to be a criminal. Um, and isn't there, there a rush to being a criminal uh, in, in a game like GTA 3, right? So... You know, all of the, first of all, thank you everybody for sharing. Um, but also, you know, like this is why, this is where meaning is. And, and same goes for like, you know, if somebody were to play a game like, you know, dysphoria, and maybe they're struggling with gender dysphoria, um, and they play a game like that and they're like, wow, I feel represented or something like that. Um you know, that, that's important. That's meaning. You want to have that experience. And that's what we build, you know. And, and a thing that you really need to understand when we do this is that... Um, all right, Super Mario World. I love it. Um, so the thing that you need to understand is that, like, what we're manipulating is not, I'm just going to grab, like, Photoshop, you know, uh, don't worry, this is not a final graphic, this is a concept graphic, uh, somebody whipped together, but I'm going to use it as, like, a basis for some UI art, um, but, you know, like, we don't manipulate... What we do as game designers is not, like, using Unreal really well. I'm just the best at Unity. No. <laughs> like, I'm really great at Maya. That's not the point of our job. The point of our job is everything you just talked about. Everything that's deep within you that, you know, is that thing that you carry with you. Um, that a game facilitated. That's games. You know, and it's hard to, when you're make when you're learning to make games, it's hard to remember that. But like, that's what got you here. And that's what hopefully will keep you going on. And if you can remember that, you can be better than the people that don't know that. Um, you know, and I can tell you from experience, like I've actually won contracts even in my, my, you know, career as a person making, like, serious games, I've won contracts over people that don't understand this because I understand this. And this is what you need to understand when you're making games. This is what the most important thing is. It's not the software you use. It's not the medium. It's not that, you know, none of, none of you said... <sighs> I'm just, I'm thinking about just the polygon count in this one boss. That really near and dear to my heart. Man, they must have really used ZBrush well. It, none of you said that. And that's, that's because it's all extra. That's not the core of game. That's not what matters about games. What matters is the player experience and the emotions that we build. And what we do is we manipulate the elements of games to build those emotional experiences. And the rest is just other stuff. So, uh, by the way, some of these definitions come from this book, Rules of Play, Game Design Fundamentals. If you are interested in um, if you've taken my Games for Education course, this is one of the, the textbooks for the course. Um, so I hope you still have your copy. And if you do, this is like, again, one of the seminal books on game design theory out there. Um, I've read my copy twice. It's one of my favorite books on game design. I still refer to it very regularly in my work. 
Um, so, you know, if you've not taken the course or you can't or whatever, um, for whatever reason or another, but you're interested in game design, buy this book. It is well worth your money. Uh, still sitting on it. It's so good. And it has reused feet on it. You know, and and Mario Clouds and, and Asteroids. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, the technology is just technology. I mean, you know, like, that goes away. You know, we're going to be looking at watchdogs and, you know, or like Doom or whatever, like 10 years from now and be like, look at that bad 3D. We thought this looked good. Um, and, you know, I hear it when people are like, oh my God, they need to remake Resident Evil 4 because look at those models. And I'm like, this was like the best looking 3D we'd ever seen in 2004. Um, you know, and, but because it's, you know, coming on 20 years old soon, it's like, oh, I guess, yeah, I mean... If you judge it by graphics, I guess, but the game is perfect. Um, so again, this is like games are not, and this is why, you know, when we talk about games, um, you know, think about like a 3D shooter versus a, a card game. So first thing I want you to understand is that because games all have similar elements and similar emotional cores where player experience is the key, you need to understand that games are like they have all universal components so there's still something similar between 3d games and like a deck a, you know a game you play with a deck of cards right um and you know so one thing that you hear a lot is that like people will kind of turn games into this hierarchy so they might be like oh you know a 3d game or like a card game or something and they'll like they'll do this they'll they might even make this hand gesture and like you know oh you know like Fortnite and poker and it's like what um you know how do you even compare the two um and and it's because there's this artificial perception that like a 3d a big triple a 3d game is inherently bigger than you know a card game or something um and, and having launched a card game, I can actually tell you that, like, you know, you, you think about, like, making a card game and you're like, oh, yeah, no, it's just going to be like a quick game project. You know, two and a half years. Uh, that took two and a half years. And I had to learn <laughs> new skills like um, managing shipping, international shipping, um, you know, overseeing print production, um from like another country you know there's there's all kinds of stuff like kickstarter fulfillment um so there's all kinds of stuff that that you know nothing is really small there are there are really no small games um because you know making them will take a long time but also you know like let's look at these two games in in 2011 2012 it was kind of a popular thing for gamers to be like yeah you know like a, a big game like skyrim or something like little and dumb and casual like angry birds i would argue that angry birds succeeds in more of its goals than skyrim does you know or like insert you know, simple mobile game, simple mobile game, and big AAA game, right? Um, and the reason for that is because, like, big AAA games sometimes have such huge scope that, like, maybe they do some things really well, but then maybe they do some things less well. And that's okay, because their scope is really big. Um, Bethesda games, and I'm not trying to, like, pick on Bethesda, but... You know, a common criticism of Bethesda, the nicer version of a common criticism of Bethesda, is like, maybe they try to bite off more than they can chew in some of the things that they make. So, you know, when the woolly mammoths in Skyrim kind of like float upward like they're being picked up by a UFO, you just kind of go, <laughs> Bethesda, glitches. Um, but uh, I said glitches, for the record, when I said that. Um... 
But like, you know, that's what happens when you try to make something huge. Angry Birds is a physics-based game where you launch a thing at a stack of stuff and try to kill other things, like crush other things in the stuff. That's it. And it like, everything just seems to work in it. it but, you know, it's also a try, it's trying to accomplish less. And in accomplishing less, it hits more of its targets. Um, and, you know, the point being is that, like, it's hard to compare the two. I'm just trying to be provocative when I, like, say, oh, well, Angry Birds hit, accomplishes more of its goals. Um, it does, but I'm also, like, poking at something here where I want you to like dispense with this notion that there is this like oh my god you know beacon on the hill that is this triple a game and that everything else must bow to its magnificence and that's not me picking on triple a i'm just saying that like so there are just different kinds of games and you should you should see them as a spectrum of choices of things to make instead of like i must make this because it is higher than this no sometimes you make a video game that's 3d sometimes you make 2d you know it's because you choose from this spectrum games exist on a horizontal spectrum not on a not on a, a tower um there's no tower um there's just kind of like a shelf of choices for you and you know making games is not you trying to climb a tower um, it can feel like it at times. Maybe your career might be trying to climb a tower, but you don't have to <laughs> make something AAA to prove your chops. Um, it's a, so like, you know, it's really hard to compare games that are in these like vastly disparate genres, you know, like there's there's like no point in saying something like well you know Fortnite versus like Gone Home it's just like I don't know like something big like Fortnite or like whatever like Gone Home no you it's you can't they're not trying to accomplish the same things they're not doing the same things they are not you can't really compare and contrast works like that because they don't really have common elements um, except maybe that they have programming and art and sound. Um, but beyond that, they are, they are set up with very different missions. They're trying to accomplish different missions. And that's important to understand when you are trying to, this is all to say that everything you think are reasons to talk about games are not the things that are core to games. And what's important about knowing that is that you stop thinking of games. Like I've had students, you know, Say like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do my trailer in 4K. Um, it's that's not important. What's important is like, well, does your level design create a good player experience? Um, you know, what is it? Does your core mechanic really kind of sing? You know, are you providing? Um, you know, oh, it's a multiplayer map. You know, you're providing enough pathfinding such that like your your players are going to find a way to like you know, get to where they need to be to, to compete and things like that. That's the important stuff. That's the vital stuff is this like, you know, player experience, player, uh, pastime of, of the thing you make. And, you know, what this does is it gets you hopefully away from, and I really want you to internalize this. You should not be thinking of the quality of your games in the old sort of like and I realize, you know, game press doesn't make it easy. You're kind of trained to think this way. And, you know, some of the things you make might be evaluated in this way. But I want you to get away from this notion of, like, graphics, 4 out of 5, sound design, 3 out of 5, gameplay, 5 out of 5, Fun factor, five out of five. So we can forgive its graphic and sound shortcomings because it's really good. Um, no, that's not how we talk about games. Um, and if you don't believe me, look at the article. If they rated movies like they rated video games and it's like, you know, what was it? 
this came out when like the World War Z movie came out and it was like, you know, this Brad Pitt movie is a very competently made movie. The lighting is always nice and the camera never fell down. Like, it's not how we talk about other art. It's not how we should be talking about games. Don't you do it. Because that's not really what creates emotional experience. What creates emotional experience is, like I said, manipulating different elements of games and tuning them so that they heighten certain experiences or emotions. So what can we tune as a designer? Well, one of the things we can tune is the players, which of course are people. Yeah, 7.8 7 out of 10, too much water. See? like. Um, I get that reference. Um, so one of the things we can do is tune the players. Now that, that's not to say that we can like go and, you know, give some sort of diatribe to the players about what our game's about. Um, that's actually really bad game design. If you've taken games for education, you've heard me rant about that specific thing. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is first and foremost, when we come up with our game and we come up with our core mechanic, part of that core mechanic might involve talking about what the players are doing and what they are competing or interacting against. So, you know, sometimes when you make a game, you make a game where it's like the, a single player plays the video game and maybe they're competing with the video game. Um, Super Mario Brothers, Legend of Zelda, uh, Halo single, single player, Doom single player, um, a single player experience, right? Um, but sometimes you maybe have a co-op game, now you know, or team competition, or a game where like, you know, one player is has to get away from like other people hunting them but the people hunting them are also competing. Um, or that, but with the video game in some way. Or direct competition. All of this is to say that, you know, the way that players interact with each other might affect the way the game feels, if that makes sense. So, like, Left 4 Dead. I loved Left 4 Dead. It got me through grad school. I absolutely positive and again there's an emotional experience that will never be i will never be in grad school exhausted brain fried needing uh you know chicken from this one chicken place near my house and needing to unwind but also like not really compete against other people needing to like i want to collaboratively blow off steam oh, left for dead you know emotional gaming experience but what and one of the things that initiated that was co-op gaming against a game system of you know the director make it putting zombies and and tanks and and uh you know um boomers and stuff in my way and you know coming out with like okay you get up on that barn you get on that roof you 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 know hide behind this truck and then you know when this comes you use this rifle and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, that felt really good. And that was because it created this really great interpersonal player experience. Everything from, you know, when you work with a really great team and you feel like you, you know, have a good rapport and are really, you know, going on all cylinders and maybe you go through a level faster than you usually do. Or on the flip side, time when maybe you had like a not so great team member or a team member who thought they were playing a different video game and like wandered away and you're like and they died you know um because they thought they were playing team fortress so you know like but that's a memorable meaningful thing and it's all based on how your players interact with each other next objectives what are the things you're trying to do in the game? We can manipulate that. Now, what does that mean? Well, here's a list of objectives. Um, you have access to the lecture slides, so I don't need to take time to have you, like, go through all these. But, you know, 
we can talk about like the objectives really get into core mechanics. Like what is it that what is and, and goals? What is the thing you're trying to do in your game? Um, you know, capture player have to avoid getting captured or killed. Um, or maybe they are capturing, capture the flag, uh, chasing, you know, playing a game of tag and chasing, um, you know, uh, racing against each other, have to reach a goal before anyone else does. So again, like I was a swimmer, um, and like we essentially like the entire, point of that like that the core mechanic of swimming besides swimming is like it is a race so you know lots of meaningful things about being on a team and racing um alignment you know maybe you have to align your piece like tetris you know finding the right rows in tetris i'm not going to go through all of these but the point being is that when we design games we you know come up with list of objectives. This is not exhaustive. This is just like examples uh, that are from your textbook. But the point of this is like the objectives that you put into the game model specific types of competition or specific types of behavior or specific player relationships. And that again molds the experience. So you having, you know, that, that, um, Exploring the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Unlocking that world and the different ma abilities of the different masks and the social things that you have, the social things that you interact with to get those masks is meaningful. So you're kind of like digging deep into this, you know, you're digging through the dirt of this game and, you know, you keep finding these rewarding things. So you, you're motivated to dig more. That's, that's good. Um, you know, fighting competition, uh, you know, that's, again, that's not really on here, but like, or, you know, playing Mario Kart or Melee with, with friends of yours, right? Like that's, you know, that is meaningful. That has good memories for you. Um, and it, again, that's because like the objective supports different types of in interaction, supports different types of gameplay and rewards and, you know, feelings. So procedures and rules, what you can and can't do, you know, that's another thing we can manipulate as designers and that makes emotions. So, um, procedures are things like, you know, how does a game start? If you've ever played a board game and the set, I mean, this is a problem in so many board games that I'm not saying that like, this is a sign of a bad game, but how many times have you had game night with your friends? And you're like, oh, you got to try this game. It's awesome. And, you know, you're, you start to set it up. And the whole experience deflates because the setup is really long and boring. Um, and this is why, like, you know, there are so many things that say, like, if you're introducing a new game to your friends, you really should set it up beforehand. Because, you know, I love that X-Wing game. Setting it up sucks. <laughs> Because you're like, I got to put all the little peg, the ships on the pegs. Hold on. I got to get all the little tokens out. Um, that kind of like blow, like deflates the entire experience. Um, so procedures of gameplay, like you can control how these work um, and how they either heighten or lower the experience for people. You know, is progression engaging? Are people waiting for their turn too long? That can really make things not interesting. You know, if there's something entertaining to watch while somebody else is playing the game and taking their turn, great. Or maybe the turns happen simultaneously, uh, like in the game Diplomacy, or maybe they're just fast, you know? Um, are there any special interesting actions? How do things resolve? How many games have you ever played? And I'm... I'm trying not to bait people to be like, Mass Effect 3, you know, or something like that. But how many games have really, I'm going to try to push you towards thinking about board games, really. But how many games have like unsatisfying endings? And again, I'm not talking about a, a cutscene that 
fails to wrap up the story. I'm talking about like, you know, a board game where like the win condition isn't that interesting, but maybe the gameplay is really good. But you know, when you have to finish the game, it's kind of like, oh, I guess it's like anticlimactic. Um, you know, Monopoly. Yeah, Monopoly is a great a great example. Um, Monopoly is also an interesting example because everybody is actually playing it wrong. Um, but so, uh, rules, uh, you know, so that's procedures. That's just like, you know, the stuff you do to make the game happen. And then rules are the actual like do's and don'ts. So, you know, when you write out rules, you're defining like this type of card does this, this type of pawn does that. This type of enemy behaves in a certain way. Um, think of Halo, actually. I think, well, Doom, I mean, most shooters are like this, but any any action game, haha. -ha. Um, any action game where there's maybe like set monster types uh, is a good example of this because, like, you know, there are rules in Halo to how a grunt acts. And if you shoot the nearby elite, the grunts will run away. That's a rule of Halo, you know, because it's like a character behavior of those pieces. Uh, so imagine like paper prototyping a grunt. It's like, okay, you have your little army guy who's Master Chief, and you can shoot the three aliens in front of you, and you shoot the elite. And then it's like, well, you know, if a... You could have a little thing in the rule book that says if a grunt is X number of spaces near an elite... It is, the elite is its captain, and if that elite is killed, then, you know, turn the grunt away from the player and have them immediately, like, run in that direction or something. Um, how do we play Monopoly? Well, so, so many people with Monopoly play with, like, the free parking rule. And that's not anywhere in the actual rules of Monopoly. That's just some, like, a house rule that kind of became so folded into the way Monopoly is played that it, um, it actually, like, people perceive it to be the rule of Monopoly. Um, what it does is it artificially extends the game, and that's when you get people being like, Monopoly takes forever. Because um, in reality, Monopoly is supposed to... Like, if you play totally by the rules, Monopoly is supposed to be really fast. Um, and there's actually, like... There's actually way more bidding and trading. Like you also don't see trading of properties, but if you see like high level monopoly players and there are competitive monopoly matches uh, out there, there's way more like exchanging of properties. It's not always like I've got Marvin Gardens and it's mine forever. Um, there's a lot more wheeling and dealing. Uh, it in the way you're supposed to play, but again, it's a mark of maybe how Monopoly is designed that it doesn't end up like that. Um, so rules are, again, like the things that happen in your game. And so like, you know, when you define, okay, what effect does this have on your player? That's a rule. You know, you can create drama with, with rules being certain ways. Um, so rules take the form of everything from like written explicit rules to um, trade with each other all the time. Oh, okay, then you're, yeah, that's, supposed to be how you play uh the other thing is like collision is rules like you know i can't put my hand through my <gasps> nope i can't I still can't put my hand through my board game here and that's because physics and matter and those are the rules of the universe and you know the rules of your game space might be defined by the collision of the game space so you know, think about it as a level designer, you control the player experience by controlling how a player approaches a, a scene. So maybe that gives you the drop on enemies, maybe that creates a dramatic ambush, maybe it just like creates a cool moment of architectural, you know, environment art satisfaction from, you know, you're kind of in a narrow pathway and then it opens and you see this big vista or this cool machine or something and you're just like wow you know so maybe like those kind of moments um that's all collision and that's a rule um 
So there's this idea called the magic circle, and I know I'm not asking for any discussion right now. I'm just trying to get through the material and then we can um, chat. So the magic circle is this useful metaphor in games. And what this means is it's like the imagine, uh, imaginary word, world created by a game where the rules are law. And why do we care about this? Because when you play a game, there is an attitude that you take on. It's like a playful attitude. There's the Salem and Zimmerman have a more academic term for it, but I'm not going to use that here. But it, like, think, imagine it's just like a playful attitude. You kind of agree that we should be playing the game, right? Um, you agree to under to live in the world of the game, and what is what does that mean? Well, it might mean like, okay, I agree to play the video game, or I'm, I'm just going to like take some time to play the video game. But maybe it's like you're playing a game with your friends outside. And it's the sort of like, no, that rule's dumb. I'm going home. I'm going to take my ball and go home. Uh, you know, and that's a spoil. That person's a spoil sport because they are sort of like not agreeing to the reality and the rule of the game. So why do we care about this? Well, a few things. One, games can be incredibly transformative um, being in that that playful space that magic circle has real effect on players you can you know the offense of what happened in the magic circle sometimes they they resonate and again you imagine them outside like you know it's kind of silly in a i guess big way or in like in a, in a many years later way that like yeah why would somebody call their mom when they beat bowser in mario 3 but it's like you know no in the moment for those kids in in 1990 1991 this was like the biggest thing ever right and that's because we were like deeply immersed in this game and you know everybody got kind of caught up in it um you know there's the idea of like the transformation of a you kind of like buy into more silly things when you're inside of a game. And that, that, that has like real actual like societal good impact that, that, you know, games can make you feel better and be therapeutic in that way. Um, but you know, your sort of attention to the game is very important and the abiding by the rules. Um, games can also transform the context of the real world. And I always use the example. And, you know, if you've, if you're unfamiliar with this Robin Williams comedy bit, go look up Robin Williams golf and you will, you'll see a very good example of this. But when, you know, if I were to say, put a ball in a hole, this hole in the ground, you would pick up the ball, you'd walk to the hole and you'd put it in the ground. You would not in the real world, take the ball, go 400 yards away from the hole, put the ball on a little stick and take a, a bigger bendy stick and try to hit the ball towards the hole. And oh, by the way, there's a bunch of like pits of sand and lakes in the middle and trees. You know, you wouldn't do that. But some yet golf is on the rise because it's a great socially distant leisure activity. You know, so... Um, you know, that's another effect of being in the magic circle is that we kind of agree to silly stuff and that the silly stuff is important to take, you know, be kind of attentive to the game and get enjoyment from the game. And again, the thing that adds drama to golf is like, well, this course is easy, it's short and doesn't have that many hazards, or this course is very difficult, it's all bendy. And, you know, has like lots of sand traps, lots of bunkers. So, you know, that's how we amp up drama within this like emotional state that is being in a game, right? So that's what rules can do. They can like actually really affect your like emotional state with, you know, the elements of games can affect your emotional state while you're in this game experience. And that's why we have emotional reactions to games. <sighs> Resources. Resources are another thing we can manipulate. 
and those are things that we have value that we must manage in a game. The magic circle is important for understanding resources because <clears throat> monopoly money. Monopoly money is just paper. It has no real value. But when you're playing monopoly, it's money. It's real money in the world of monopoly. So why is that important? Because the scarcity or abundance of resources creates drama, creates action, creates interest, and can define a genre, really. You know, think about the resources you see in games. There are things like lives. Arcade games are dramatic, slash they also churn quarters out of you because they limit you heavily on the amount of lives you have, and they also ramp up the challenge. So, you know, you're you you're encouraged to pay more quarters for more lives or it gets really dramatic like how dramatic is an action game when you have only one life left if you're playing a game with lives um units you know if you're playing a real-time strategy game or a board game and you only have a few units or maybe there's like a unit that's specifically important like oh no jim rayner is gonna die um you know that creates different drama then, or you have to like protect a character in a escort mission, everybody's favorite. Um, those have, those create real drama if you like have a unit you must protect. Or if, you know, there is an imbalance in units, your enemy outnumbers you or you outnumber the enemy. That's important. Uh, so units are dramatic. Um, health, oh, I, I told the other, the class yesterday this story dealing with like special units. So I can't really keep it from you. Um, a friend of mine made a special Starcraft map when we were kids called uh, Chris Farley versus the Zerg. I don't know if you know who Chris Farley is. Um, he was a comedian in the 90s. Uh, he was in a movie called Tommy Boy and Black Sheep and he was on Saturday Night Live. Um, but he made, he made a map called Chris Farley versus the Zerg, which was basically like you had one super powerful troop and he was Chris Farley, and he was a Terran soldier, and you had to, like, beat the Zerg, but you couldn't let Chris Farley die. Uh, so you had to, like, both protect him but use him to, like, you know, because he was super powerful and can kill Zergs really easily. So, um, and then every time you'd click on Chris Farley, he would, you know, spout a line from a Chris Farley thing. But it was, you know, it was like an exercise in making special units and, and dealing with the sort of, like, risk-reward of... Do I put this unit into combat and risk him or but for his power uh, or do I like protect him and play it where I try to like, you know, deal with everything with my other troops or something like that. So but that creates interesting, you know, that creates the opportunity for what we call risk reward, where you kind of say, like, here's the risk, but here's the payoff for that taking that risk. Health is something like, you know, if you have limited health or limited chances to heal that creates more drama and and a better experience. Currency actions, like you know, it's more interesting sometimes in board games when you say like you have three actions. You can, you can take three actions, and here are your choices. That creates a sort of like economy. Or time. How many how many sports stories involve it was at the buzzer or there was a minute left, and I can't believe, you know. Like, how many things happened? Like, this football player became a legend when they drove across the field in under a minute to win. I'm picking on myself as a Browns fan again because I'm really just talking about Elway <laughs> and the drive. Um, but, you know, how many things like that exist in sports because it, it dealt with the limited resource of time. You can do that. You can... The way you tune resources creates drama, creates experience. Um, you know, think of like Resident Evil 5 versus Resident Evil 1. Resident Evil 5 is like, how many bullets you want? Have all the bullets. And it's really more of like a shooter. Resident Evil 1 is like, you got to go through that whole wing of the house. Here's your bullet. Can I somehow split it in two? And like shoot half a bullet? No, you can't. You get one bullet. Um, and here's, here's some, 
here's some uh um oh man here's some parsley there's your health item <laughs> you know um you know like that's limited resources is what makes a game like resident evil scary it helps heighten the horror because you are dealing with limited resources and thus it's more like intimidating because then like zombies are scarier because they can damage you more um every shot is a choice the last thing we can do is manipulate this conflict in the game so like conflict players compete with each other to accomplish objectives and what does that mean well you know we can create heightened drama by how we dole out obstacles again designing a golf course your golf course will be harder and have more conflict in it if you put bunkers and lakes and and trees among it instead of like a par three with you know nothing on it um with just like a big wide fairway so conflict is like again you can tune the nature of the conflict and that creates the player experience do you want your game to be hard have all of the enemies give them lots of health give them you know lots of strong attacks do you want your game to be more visceral and like you know you feel super powerful and it's a power fantasy for the player then maybe the enemies are just squishy and you know you can kind of mow them down um you know think of this example I've heard it said of Dark Souls and Doom that Dark Souls is a game in which you're in a room with demons. Doom is a game where the demons are in a room with you, locked in a room. You, you, but you know what I mean. Like, that there's, there's a very different power dynamic between the player character and the, and the enemies in those games. And that creates different feelings and moods. Um, unrelated to their genre like that we're just talking about like enemy tuning here amount and power um and like you know i'm i'm playing like doom eternal right now and like that has a very different sense of of enemy tuning than doom one had doom one like you were just mowing through stuff doom two is like these things seem a little better at their job in this one um, so obstacles and opponents, that's what we can do. We can like tune the severity of those things to, to create different conflict experiences. Dilemmas are a little harder. Dilemmas are where you give players a choice and you make that choice difficult and that choice becomes memorable. So let me offer you this one from, um, one of my games. You can have a weapon in those games where you have one weapon equipped and you know, you draw them from like a treasure deck when you, you know, earn a treasure. So let's say you have the Peasant's Club and you draw from the treasure deck in this game and it says the Sword of Amadis plus three strength. They don't really do anything else. They're like equal in every, you know, they don't have, neither has a special, this isn't like the magic Peasant's Club. It's just a stick with plus one strength. So if you get this sword that's really just a sword but it's a plus three sword you're like oh no i'm um, unless there's some other reason for you to take the keep the peasants club you're gonna take that that sword that is not a dilemma that's that's a choice and you can choose to keep the peasant stick but it's not a dilemma it's not a hard choice to make here's more of a dilemma um you have a sword you have Lancelot's sword, and it's plus two strength. Um, so you draw the sword of Amadis, and it's plus three strength. And you're like, ah, oh, well, I should take the sword of Amadis. But wait, um, Lancelot's sword has plus, add plus one to all die rolls. Hmm. Now you need to start thinking. Technically, this still is not that hard of a choice, because in that game, you'd want to have the plus one to all die rolls. But, you know, it has some effect. Now it's an interesting choice now there's something to think about there's a you know risk reward here you maybe have less raw power and you could get a bad die roll you could roll a one and that plus one's not going to do much for you with this nice sword 
you could have the plus three could have put you over the top on an attack or something but like that's a risk reward that's a dilemma but you could add plus one to die rolls to really do some damage or you know maybe some other non-battle related die roll but you see that's the kind of stuff you set up and this becomes way more interesting than again do you want the stick or the sword and i realize we're almost at time um a few more slides Boundaries are things we control. Boundaries are lines on a basketball court, uh, spatial limitations to play, markers on a field. Collision, that's your boundaries. And manipulating those boundaries makes things interesting. Resident Evil zombie that doesn't just go, it's not just bullet fodder zombie, plus narrow hallway equals interesting, you know? Versus like if you had a Resident Evil zombie in like a big auditorium, that's not as interesting. So space can create interest, and that matters. Um, boundaries on a basketball court, three-point shots, like rules surrounding boundaries, like three-point shots and free throws and things like that, create interest. Uh, and then finally is outcome, which is the state of play at the end. So controlling outcome is, is another part of games that's really interesting. And the reason for this, and nothing really more needs to be said than this, is outcomes have to be uncertain for games to be interesting. It's not interesting when, you know, it, it wouldn't be interesting if I were to go up against the protagonist of the Queen's Gambit in a game of chess. That would be a bloodbath. I would be defeated so fast. Uh, she would just take me to school. Um, and thus it would be uninteresting for both of us. It would be embarrassing and sad for me because really you got me in two moves. Uh, you're really good. And she would just be bored. Um, so, you know, outcomes, uh, like that's uninteresting for everybody involved and you wouldn't want to watch that. Um, but it's interesting when you go up against somebody who is, at the same level to you. Now, if the game is not designed to allow that uncertainty, two people equally matched, but like one has 10 in their army and the other has two, um, the 10 in the army is gonna win even if they've both never played the game before. So, you know, you need to design your game such that they provide a good source of drama. And that's it. Um, Thank you for going along with the long period of, of uh, lecture there um, and not discussion. But um, any questions, comments, anything you want to chime in on, uh, anything you want to ask questions about, go for it. I'm going to take a drink. Where'd my water bottle go? There you are. You're welcome. I hope that was, I hope that was um, enlightening. Like I said, I mean... Just be better. Um, so one of the things that I will say, uh, so this week, your case study is, I want you to, if you have access to these, I recommend playing them. If you don't have access to them, I recommend watching videos and I've provided links to videos in Blackboard. But um, the games this week are Tecmo Super Bowl for the NES, NBA Jam Arcade, any uh, SNES Genesis, um, Street Fighter Two, arcade SNES Genesis. Um, the reason I want you to play those is that they are games. They are video games that model sports, uh, different types of sports, but which have through the manipulation of their their um, elements, their components create very different experiences from playing the sport. So, um, you know, Tecmo Super Bowl is different from, you know, American football because you are, you're playing shorter quarters, uh, you have a more limited number of plays, so it's much more like quicker paced. You don't, and you don't, you're not like playing Madden where you kind of go through an entire playbook. Um, and you know, everything's kind of simplified. NBA Jam, it's two on two and other elements are heightened, like, you know, he's on fire and all that other stuff. Everybody can dunk somehow. 
Everybody can dunk. Um, except Mark Price, it feels like sometimes. Um, and by by manipulating those elements of oh and also again shorter periods by manipulating those aspects of basketball it creates a very different type of basketball so you it's like lower number of players lower num, lower amount of time heightened jump heightened this and you, you know you kind of see somebody almost like if any of you do audio it's like the equivalent of imagine somebody at a at a board turning down certain channels, turning up other channels, and that creates the feeling of NBA Jam. Um, same thing with Street Fighter. It's not like real MMA. It's, you know, like, again, different types of, uh, you know, types of fighting. That one's mostly a stretch. It's not really like MMA, but it is like if two people were to get into a brawl, it wouldn't work out necessarily like Street Fighter. Um so would you say games are castle like Castlevania are considered boring because the outcome is always the same? Uh, Dracula losing to Belmont. Um, no, because you're thinking of outcome, I guess, in terms of like ending, you know, um, like reaching the ending of the story. Like you're always going to get to the ending of the story. Um, outcome might be like of a play session. So, you know, maybe you marathon symphony of the night and you know like that's kind of interesting but moments of drama first of all you're like talking about i love castlevania games so no they're not always boring um what i mean in terms of like outcome would be you know i'm gonna try to play symphony of the night with a luck-based build instead of a you know, just like always getting the more powerful weapon. And what's that going to do? How is it going to make certain bosses harder because I, I am not as powerful or something like that? But maybe I get better drops. So there's uncertainty in, you know, what elements am I going to encounter? What uh, weapons are going to drop when I, you know, do certain, when I build Alucard out in certain ways? Um you know, what is that experience going to be like? Um, so, and, and then, yeah, like you might get kind of like rocked by an enemy. Maybe your timing's off or something when you're fighting them. So then it, you have heightened drama when it's like, oh my God, I have really low life, but I'm really f f uh, far from a save point. Um, and then there's like maybe this enemy, this strong enemy in the middle of like my route back to the save point. Um, so that that does create interest because what you do is it's like the moment to moment gameplay. Don't think of when I say outcome, I mean like the ending. It's like, it's uncertain in those moments. If I like get hit by an enemy a few times and I have to get back to a, a place to heal me having to like be super duper careful to get back. Um, that's dramatic. And, and I mean, I actually like can remember instances of that in games I've played, like Hyper Light Drifter, where the drama is like ratcheted up and like that sticks with me. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think that that makes them boring at all. I think that makes them interesting and dramatic in the way like a long TV show would be. Um, even if you know what the outcome is, it's like the journey is interesting. Um, and then yeah, the Dracula fight's interesting too. Unless you've got two Chris Grimms, then you can just kind of like take them out really quick but again you feel really good having gotten those chrysograms <laughs> single player games i can say are tough because if you're if you're just competing against the game system my feeling at least is that like if there's a way to break the game in the player's favor that's also kind of fun because then the player gets the feeling of like i broke it and now it, i'm super powerful ha 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 um final fantasy games on the Super Nintendo always have a way to break them and you feel kind of satisfied doing it. So I don't, I think with single player experiences, you can get away with those. If you kind of like make the process of becoming overpowered kind of arcane. Uh, it makes sense why people enjoy the aspect of meaningful choice and multiple endings now. Yeah. Multiple endings do get like they, you know, it can be exciting to get to the same ending Multiple endings do give you a little bit of that, like juicing the amount of endings if you do want to have some, you create a bigger what's called possibility space. 
Um, burr, 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 burr. Played Rocket League an embarrassing amount of time. Yeah, like Rocket League is a good one. Um, you know, and so when I say like unsure outcome, that really hits the closest with like competitive games where you're not playing for a long time. For a longer single player experience, it is really like, you know, that's a different, you're, you're like playing to see a story a lot in those two. So it's like, you know, Final Fantasy will never change. You like, there will never be, the live stream will never not stop Meteor in Final Fantasy VII. Maybe at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake, but I don't know. Like, but when you're playing original Final Fantasy VII, that cutscene will always play. That doesn't mean that the game is boring. That means like, you know, you've you've reached the end of the book and that's, that's why you play that. Outcome of player, uh, yeah, it's like a series of experiences in a play session, exactly. So, um, and again, like some of those games heighten that versus like a play session could be, we're playing NBA Jam. And that is like a 20 minute to half hour game versus like you know oh i'm gonna i'm just gonna unwind by playing some symphony of the night and then you run into an enemy you can't beat and you're like i don't feel good um or like you know oh that was more dramatic than i thought because i got really low in health or i got this awesome pickup and like your play session might be like an hour because that's what you have time to do so cool thank you for all the wonderful discussion everybody um this was great as always if you have any other questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out on Discord. Remember, next week is uh, Project One is due. So, you know, please make sure that uh, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each group a time slot and just be ready to present Tuesday. Um, you know, for your t and, and, you know, there will be time slots like throughout the week. But so be prepared to present on Tuesday just so that like, you know, everybody's prepared your game doesn't have to be done done it just has to be showable um you have until next thursday at midnight to actually turn your game in but you've got to show it during your class time um if you're worried about like oh no there's a feature missing or there's a bug don't tell me about it play around the bug don't encounter the bug or play around the missing content don't alert people to it don't do the thing where you're like oh man i'm gonna show my game but it sucks you know be like i'm gonna show my game pretend you're at e3 <laughs> just play the game showing the good stuff don't mention the bad stuff um and that's how you present a game so we're gonna do that uh next week and then on to project two after that so all right see you later everybody